Uh, we have a good crowd, uh, and I, I know more are coming. Everybody's really excited to hear uh, Dr. Holloway's lecture, so I'm not going to eat up a lot of time. Uh, you're here to see um, you're here to see Tracy Holloway. I'm Paul Robbins. I'm the dean of the Nelson Institute for Environmental Studies here at the University of Wisconsin Madison, and today I am I have the great honor of introducing uh, Professor Tracy Holloway. Tracy holds the Gaylord Nelson Distinguished Chair in Integrated Environmental Studies. That is an endowed chair that held for uh, uh, repeated years by only some of our most elite scientists, scholars, uh, uh, and thinkers on campus. Um, and it's, uh, it's one that comes with an obligation, which is to share the knowledge and the scholarship with the community of the world. And Tracy's been good enough following in uh, the line of, of others who've held this uh, distinguished position to agree to this lecture today. And we're hoping, I oh, see people are piling in. So um, so this lecture is, is part of a tradition and Tracy is carrying it on, but more than that, uh, it's really a chance for the people who hold this chair to share the urgent knowledge that they have and, and part of the Institute's uh, mission to connect with the broader public, which is something Tracy does very well. She is a super, superstar member of our faculty her work with NASA and other agencies is known and respected not only here, but across the, the country and around the, around the world. Her leadership in both the Nelson Institute's Center for Sustainability and the Global Environment and the Nelson Institute's Energy Analysis and Policy Program. I think we, I bet we've got a bunch of alums from EAP uh, logging in right now, uh, is tremendous to behold. She's a terrific inspiration to me, she serves as a team lead for the NASA Health and Air Quality Applied Sciences team, uh, some work about which you will hear today. She also, as I mentioned, lead, uh, helps lead the energy analysis and policy program here at Nelson, which is an enormously exciting and productive program for all of our students across campus. And she's also co-founder and served as the first president of the Earth Science Women's Network, which has a mission of supporting the scientists of today and tomorrow and welcoming a diverse community to uh, the world of science. Uh, I think among all of her projects, uh, she's gonna save some lives with air quality, but she's gonna change a lot of lives in the work she's doing in diversifying the community. She's gonna uh, share her thoughts today and her science. Uh, I'm sure you will learn a lot. Two pieces of housekeeping before I get out of her way. One, live captioning for this is available for those who need it. And all you have to do is go to the multimedia viewer Yep. I don't know how to do that, but you are smarter than I am, so you can figure it out. Uh, that's so I'll one. jump in. I'll just jump in really quick, Paul. I so if you go over to the right hand side of your screen, the multimedia viewer player should be in the list, um, and you can hit the little carrot, and it'll drop down. You'll have to sign in, and then um, you should be able to see the live captioning. Great. And that's a great service and thanks for making it available. Second piece of housekeeping is Tracy's going to give us uh, a talk for maybe a half hour, a little shorter. Um, I, I will give her the floor and then we're gonna come back and we're gonna take Q&A and this is gonna be super lively. All you gotta do is go over to the Q&A box in my, what's the, my bottom right um, and type in your question and we'll triage it in case we get some redundant questions and I'll feed those directly to Tracy and she will respond to you in as, as something like real time. So without further ado, my enormous pleasure to introduce my colleague and friend, Tracy Holloway. Thank you so much, Paul, for that really nice introduction. And thank you to Emily for bringing this together and helping um, make, get all the pieces in place. It is really an honor to be speaking to you today on the 50th anniversary of the Nelson Institute. Uh, the 50th anniversary of the year of Earth Day, the 50th anniversary of the founding of the Environmental Protection Agency, and very close to my heart, the 50th anniversary of the Clean Air Act. My research deals with air quality, and I'll be talking to you today about um, some of that work and the broader context that it's taking place in. So to start out, I'll share my screen um, here and go to a full screen. Um, so uh, really, you know, when I think about uh, air quality and climate, I love the <clears throat> metaphor of the horizon because much has changed in the past 50 years since the founding of the Clean Air Act. And I think that 50 years from now, we will look back and see <clears throat> dramatic changes 
uh, that have taken place uh, in the years to come. So we're going to be peeking around the corner, seeing what may be coming next, um, but starting out by looking back in time. <coughs> um, I wanted to start this talk actually with the news. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> it's like I uh, see this picture of particulate matter and immediately have to cough. Uh, this was in on CNN uh, taken yesterday in uh, Oregon. Images like this are all over the news and social media because they are mind boggling uh, to imagine so much uh, smoke in the sky that it's <clears throat> creating an atmosphere that reminds us of Mars. Um, what you're seeing here is the effect of high levels of particulate matter, in this case coming from forest fire smoke. Um, and as light from the sun passes through the smoke, the blue gets filtered away. That's what makes the sky blue. And what we're left with when there's enough smoke is this red uh, light coming to the surface. So this is really unusual in today's America, um, so much so that it's all over the news. But if you look back 50 years, it was not unusual to see really visible, heavy layers of air pollution in many parts of the United States, both small towns that had industrial activity and big cities. Like here you see Boston in 1969. Of course, this wasn't an everyday occurrence. Air pollution is like the weather and it varies from day to day, month to month um, and year to year. It's driven both by what's being emitted into the atmosphere from forest fires, from power plants, from cars and trucks, as well as the weather conditions that can mix it away or trap it in place to build up to unhealthy levels. Um, the most famous air pollution event uh, you may have heard of is the 1952 London smog. And I like to start with that as an example because we can see so clearly in the data how air pollution affects public health. Um, this is a, an analysis of the patterns in mortality. That's the, the solid line, how many people uh, in London were dying each week um, compared to sulfur dioxide, one of the many pollutants that was emitted from coal burning in London uh, in the 1950s and trapped by the weather conditions that occurred on that date in December 1952. And what you see here is that on your average day in London prior to the um, air pollution event, uh, about, well, in your average week, about 1,500 people would die. But during the week of the pollution event, that got up near 5,000. And in fact, it stayed elevated for months after the event, even when the air cleared due to the weather patterns, the impact on public health uh, stayed because people who got sick during that week might have suffered for weeks or months uh, before passing away. Uh, the same type of approach where we compare health outcomes and air pollution is still used today to understand the impacts of uh, air pollution around the world and to drive policies, especially here in the US, where I'll be talking about today. Um, it's rarely as clear as it is in this picture where you can see with your eyes. Uh, usually epidemiologists have to use sophisticated statistical methods to separate out the impact of different pollutants from each other, from weather conditions, and from other things like the day of the week that could affect people's um, checking in at a hospital emergency room. The good news when it comes to these health damaging air pollutants is that in the United States, they have been going down dating back to 1970. And uh, these six common pollutants, sometimes called the criteria pollutants, have all gone down um, and as a group have gone down about 75%. Even as our economy has grown, our population has grown, our energy use has grown, um, and we drive more. Uh, carbon, over this time, carbon dioxide has also grown because the same technical solutions that we can use for um, health relevant pollutants like scrubbers on smokestacks or cleaner burning engines, uh, those don't have the same benefit to carbon emissions for climate change. And I'll be talking at the end of my talk on win-win uh, solutions for both climate and air quality. But from a health damaging perspective, from an air quality perspective, in many ways, Air pollution has been a success story 
starting in 1970 with the Clean Air Act. Um, as I mentioned, it's not just one pollutant that's going down, but really all of these reactive health damaging pollutants. And we can see it from the ground, like the images that I uh, just showed you, those were from instruments across the United States, but we can also see it from space. And Paul mentioned that one of my major activities has been trying to make satellite data more relevant to public health and air quality. I lead the national team for NASA that is working to understand how public health organizations and air quality managers could use satellite data more effectively in their work. And one of the um, outcomes of our team has been the um, excitement around using the satellite data of NO2 as a marker for fossil fuel burning. And just to show you what I'm talking about here, you see um, uh, 2005 satellite data across the United States. And you can see hot spots in the Midwest where there's a lot of power plants, big cities like Chicago and Los Angeles, New York. Um, and uh, this image was made by my colleague, Brian Duncan at NASA, who serves as a member of um, the team I lead. Uh, over time, and here's 2019, these pollution levels have gone down, down, down. And that's because of restrictions on vehicles, uh, cars and trucks, on power plants, and a transition from higher polluting fossil fuels like coal to lower polluting fossil fuels like uh, natural gas. Of course, there's more that could be done moving toward non emitting cars like electric vehicles and non emitting power sources like uh, solar and wind, among others. Um, but even with the system we have in place, we can see huge reductions in nitrogen dioxide. You may have seen some of these images in the news over the past few months because these same space-based images have been used to look at the impact of um, shutdowns in response to the novel coronavirus pandemic. And here's just one of many images that have um, been used to understand the changes in the economy, how people are driving, how people are, how industries are operating. Um, and we can compare on the upper uh, part of this slide, the um, spring average over the past four years, uh, looking at um, NO2 and comparing that with March 2020 uh, at the height of the shutdown. And you can see that because people were staying home and not driving, you could see a very clear um, impact on uh, this invisible gas in the atmosphere. Despite the fact that um, air pollution has been going down in the United States, it is still a major public health concern. And one way to look at that concern is to see the counties across the United States that are in violation of the health-based standards set by the EPA. And what you're looking at is uh, a map showing um, areas that are in violation of one of the uh, six pollutants regulated um, this way by the EPA, and those are the green, all the way up to counties that are violating all six of those pollutants, and that's um, the, the pink uh, shown here. Even though most of the US from an area perspective is compliant, com in compliance with these um, health standards, in fact, almost half the population lives in areas that are violating the standards. You can see here that some of the biggest cities are um, above the health based standard. And in Wisconsin, um, many parts of the state near the lake are above the health based standard for ground level ozone. And I'm happy to answer any questions like this during the Q&A. So when I think about what's next, what's coming next, how do we address these remaining health challenges in the US as well as around the world where air quality is still at uh, extremely high levels in many areas, especially parts of India, parts of China uh, and other countries due to many different sources. It could be the use of coal, um, it could be the use of um, uh, wood and dung for um, rural energy use. There's a lot of different uh, reasons why countries have um, bad air pollution, and there's a lot of solutions that are ready to go. But one of the challenges in understanding air pollution is the lack of data. Most, while the United States has thousands of monitors 
Uh, even in the United States, many areas don't have any ground-based monitor. And most countries have very few um, air pollution monitors. And of those monitors, they may or may not have publicly available data. So this is where, where it's really exciting to see the potential for satellite data to um, show where air pollution is higher or lower and how it's changing day to day and over time. So in 2011, NASA launched the first team to connect uh, NASA data with real world problems. And that was the NASA Air Quality Applied Sciences team. I was the deputy leader of that team, which ran from 2011 to 2016. Uh, in 2016, they recompeted the team and uh, expanded its focus to, to public health as well as air quality. And that's been the team that I've led since 2016, and it just is ending this summer. And you can learn more about this work at our website. We pronounce this weird acronym, HACAST.org. Um, where we are really working to understand the needs of real world organizations and do research that helps connect their information needs with advanced science from NASA. So to me, it's a really exciting uh, example of the kind of interdisciplinary environmental work that goes on at the Nelson Institute, because we are really working to put advanced science in the hands of decision makers uh, and experts who may not have otherwise used these data. When we're thinking about what does NASA data look like, um, there's a lot of different tools and resources available, but the backbone of our work has been trying to connect data from satellites. And there's a constellation of satellites in space that are providing uh, images of the Earth every day, sometimes multiple times a day, for many different chemical species in the atmosphere, as well, of course, as land use, like you may have looked at on Google. But while land use data for, for, um, from satellites is, has made it into everyday use, uh, many organizations still are not aware of satellite data or aren't using it for a variety of reasons. And this is why um, this NASA team is intended to be a bridge between the scientists uh, and NASA researchers and the applications organizations that could use the data. And um, we just wrapped up our final showcase, which would have been at NASA headquarters in DC, but of course was virtual uh, due to the pandemic. Um, but one of the things that I like to look at as an indicator of, did we reach these new audiences? Did we connect with experts at state agencies, at city health departments? And the answer is yes. And one of the ways we did it was by having uh, meetings every six months. And I worked closely with Dagan Miller, who um, actually came out of a postdoc program through the Nelson Institute uh, Culture, History, and Environment Program. And Dagan uh, and I have worked together to really build a, a strong communication system for our team, a communication system that includes web-based resources, um, dialogue and these meetings, which have spanned from Atlanta uh, to California uh, and many places in between, including here in Madison. And we've uh, over this time seen a steady rise in our in-person attendance, as well as a steady rise in our online attendance. And it's been exciting to see that the excitement uh, of new users and using NASA data has been growing with these meeting um, as one indication through these meetings. Um, this team that I lead has uh, over 70 investigators involved. It's been a four year project. There's a lot going on, but I wanna tell you about one of the projects that I've been leading with my colleague, Monica Harkey, um, where we've been working with the EPA uh, on data for their national air toxics assessment. Um, the national air toxics assessment comes out every few years and is looking at a wide range of different chemicals in the environment um, and how they affect public health. Of these chemicals, the outdoor pollution that's most that is um, most associated with cancer is formaldehyde. And you may remember formaldehyde from your high school science class or from um, if you've gotten some plywood furniture and that funny smell, that's formaldehyde. Um, but formaldehyde also comes from uh, chemical reactions in the atmosphere. 
And formaldehyde is an indicator of where ozone or smog is being formed as well. So um, there are ground-based monitors for formaldehyde, but not that many of them. And the EPA was wondering whether satellite data could be used to uh, better understand uh, the distribution and change in formaldehyde and to help evaluate whether the models they're using to estimate formaldehyde exposure are correct. So um, our colleagues at uh, EPA sent us the model uh, data that they're using, and that's in the upper left uh, corner, and here's for 2016. And uh, Monica and I, and uh, we were in working with a team of students, but um, did a lot of analysis to compare the model formaldehyde with different satellite data products. And here are three um, shown. I'll say they're all from the same instrument, but processed in different ways to get different estimates of what is the formaldehyde in the atmosphere. And what we can see looking at these patterns is that um, on the, one, uh, the good news is that they're all in the same ballpark of values, especially in the Southeast where formaldehyde data or formaldehyde levels are the highest. Um, however, depending on which satellite image you're looking at, the model looks like it's a little too low. And it's especially low in the Western United States. So this helps understand that there may be sources of formaldehyde that aren't being fully accounted for in the current modeling being used by the NADA. So we are in regular contact with the EPA to share these results, to make sure that our analysis is consistent with their expertise, and a publication on this is actually in review uh, right now. I'm going to transition now away from NASA and satellite data to this issue of climate change. And um, climate change is, of course, something that uh, is in the news. There's a lot of discussion about it. And most of that discussion is focused on carbon dioxide, the main chemical in the air that's causing the Earth to warm. Now, this is a map of where carbon dioxide came, a uh, pie chart of where carbon dioxide came from in 2016 based on EPA data. And a little over a quarter came from transportation, a little over a quarter came from electricity, and then the rest came from other sources. But looking at this through the lens of uh, all the chemicals in the atmosphere, we can see that actually transportation doesn't just account for CO2, it also accounts for over half of the nitrogen oxides in the atmosphere. And these cause ozone smog, they cause particulate matter, and they have a direct risk to public health. Similarly, electricity uh, accounts for about a quarter of NOx emissions and over 80% of sulfur dioxide. So one of the questions that we look at is, can we find win-win solutions where we can make carbon dioxide lower while also having healthier air? And as one example of this kind of study, um, it's a, uh, project that I started a number of years ago in collaboration with the National Renewable Energy Lab, and in particular, uh, Paul Denholm, who's an alum of our Energy Analysis and Policy Program. And um, at the time, NREL had put together a proposed uh, solar energy uh, policy scenario, kind of what would be a realistic, ambitious, but not crazy um, uh, implementation of solar energy. And what we wanted to see is how would that solar energy lead to cleaner air. And so um, this is work that was uh, published by a former PhD student of mine, David Abel. And we used an advanced computer model that takes into account chemistry and weather and all sources of emissions to first kind of build a virtual atmosphere. And that's what you see on the left. This is sort of what the particulate matter across the United States or the Eastern United States would have been like under normal conditions. And then in this virtual atmosphere, we can swap out different sources of emissions to answer what if questions. And in this case, we reduced the um, uh, fossil burning power plants to respond to the scenario of more solar energy. So we, we looked at what, what if there were more solar energy consistent with this um, NREL scenario. And we found that across the Eastern United States, particulate matter went down in the summer around 5% over wide areas, and then some areas uh, near the mid-Atlantic uh, over 10%. And this is good news, but the way that we regulate uh, air pollution is not just looking at 
the long-term average behavior, but what's happening on the dirtiest days? And we were interested, if we had more solar energy, would it make all days a little bit cleaner? Would it make the clean days cleaner? Or would it make the dirtiest days cleaner? And we really wanted to see that it makes the dirtiest days cleaner because this, these are the days that are the most unhealthy um, for uh, the public. And luckily we found exactly what we were hoping to find, which is that um, solar has the biggest benefit on the dirtiest days. Um, what you're looking at here is on the uh, x-axis, the horizontal axis, this is what particulate matter would have been in our model without solar energy. And on the vertical axis, you see the percentage reduction with this solar energy scenario. And so the lines all slope up, showing that the more, the dirtier the air would have been, the bigger reduction solar gives us. And we see that this changes though, depending on where you are in the US. You get the biggest benefit in areas that are near um, coal-fired power plants like Indianapolis and Columbus, Ohio. Um, but even in New York and Chicago, you still see this positive relationship. Some of our newer work looking at these same type of questions has been funded by the Joyce Foundation. And I'm working on it with uh, Dr. Paul Meyer, um, another alum of the Energy Analysis and Policy Program, um, my current master's student in the Nelson Institute, Kieran Gallagher, uh, and others. And we are working with nonprofits across the Midwest to um, take their questions about and their policies that they're interested in and to figure out what would be the health benefits of those policies. And in this case, I'm showing you what the health benefits would be if Minnesota, Wisconsin, and Illinois all implemented 100% non-emitting electricity. And um, what you see is that there are uh, the dots show where the power plants themselves are going down, and the colored areas show uh, where the air is getting cleaner. And you can see that the benefits of this cleaner air extend beyond Minnesota, Wisconsin, and Illinois to neighboring states. Um, and so it's really uh, air pollution doesn't stop at the state line and the benefits of these clean air policies can extend over wide areas. So this is showing what's happening in the air. If you translate this into health benefits, this um, energy policy over these three states uh, saves work days, it reduces asthma, it reduces heart attacks, it reduces premature deaths. And if you value especially the premature deaths, you get billions of dollars in benefits um, just with these policies in these three states. So we find this to be a really exciting way to be part of the climate policy conversation because anything you do that reduces carbon emissions is also going to reduce these health damaging emissions and have huge impacts for public health in the region and beyond. So I can't uh, end this talk without talking about the students that I work with. I work with a great group of staff, graduate students, and undergraduates. And over time, I usually have between six and 10 undergraduate researchers in my lab at the Nelson Institute Center for Sustainability and the Global Environment, or SAGE. Um, here are a few of my former undergraduates. Um, and it's been so exciting to connect with students in disciplines all across campus. I think uh, in the past five years, I've worked with students from 15 different majors, and they're all coming at air quality from a different perspective, whether it's biology or computer science or uh, geography or chemistry. And um, we form a really nice cohort, and it's been exciting to see how these students' careers have taken off. And at the graduate level, as Paul mentioned, I do a lot of work with the Energy Analysis and Policy Program, or EAP. And just like I like to work with undergraduates from many different departments, the EAP program is a graduate program that's open to graduate students in almost any grad program on campus. So that whatever the graduate studies of the student, they can add energy on. And we all know that energy is something that connects with so much of our life, whether it's psychology or economics or engineering or the environment. And so this has been a program we've been actively trying to grow over the past few years. And it's been exciting. The class of 2020 is almost 20 students big, which is a huge jump um, based on our uh, efforts to grow the program and to make it a high value experience for our students. 
Here you're seeing photos from um, our trip to Chicago, uh, which is a new tradition that we've started a couple of years ago to bring faculty and students to meet with our alumni and potential um, employers in the energy space broadly defined uh, in Chicago. Um, so you can learn more about that at our website, uh, eap.wisc.edu. Um, and, um, and I'll end there and I look forward to question and answer and talking with all of you. All right. What you can't hear is the thunderous applause. That is <laughs> one thing that, that this format does not afford. But it does afford uh, an opportunity for excellent Q&A. So thank you, Tracy, the Gaylord Nelson Chair of Integrated Environmental Studies. So I've got a couple questions already. If you've got questions out there, just pipe right up into the q and I already got some of the queue. So uh, I'm going to come to the, the Clean Air Act question in a minute. There's an interesting one here about what impact does the smoke in the fires in the West during the summer and fall have uh, in, on solar power production? And let me add to Timothy Henderson's question there and to say that if you can't answer that off the top of your head, except to say some probably, <laughs> um, do you have the tools with the kinds of uh, tools that you have already showed us to actually answer that question? Could you tackle that easily or is it a difficult question? No, it's, it's a question that could be tackled. My research group hasn't looked into it, but others have. You absolutely see that solar energy uh, potential is lower when you have less sun. I mean, that we know that. And the biggest determinant of um, solar availability is cloud cover, uh, assuming you aren't under some trees already. Um, so smoke ask, acts a lot like cloud cover, and there have been a number of studies that have been looking at exactly how much attenuation of incoming sunlight um, affects solar panels. One issue, in addition to the fact that there's less sun hitting the solar panels, there's also the problem that that smoke in the air, it goes somewhere, and where it goes is on the ground. So you can't usually tell it if it's deposited in the grass or if it's deposited on concrete, but if it's deposited on solar panels, that actually can um, have a detriment to their, uh, of their ability to create electricity even after the event occurs. I uh, did my postdoc in New York City, and uh, I would often leave my windows open, but they'd be covered with black soot every few days because I lived on one of the um, avenues where the diesel buses would run up and down. And that same kind of deposited black soot, um, if it's deposited on a solar panel, can be a big problem. That's great. Um, I won't follow up with that except to point out that actually a lot of solar farms were right in the path of the fire in this last set of events, which of course has a devastating impact. We've got another one here and that's What's the status of air quality monitoring for hazardous air pollutants, HAPs, regulated under Section 112 of the Clean Air Act? Yeah, so um, there are a lot of hazardous air pollutants. I think the number is 187, but I could be wrong. Um, and uh, there are monitors across the U.S., but they tend to be more specialized. They tend to be more expensive, and there's certainly not as many of them as there are even for um the the criteria pollutants which is the way that epa categorizes pollutants is criteria pollutants hazardous air pollutants and then uh over the past few years climate pollutants like co2 so there are monitors they are not as widespread they tend to be um uh only uh, they're no, nothing is measuring all 187 of the pollutants so typically, if you're interested in monitor data for the HAPs, you kind of have to figure out what is the chemical that you're really interested in and then seek out where those monitors, if any, exist um, in the U.S. I had a student who did that uh, a couple, uh, about a year ago, looking at formaldehyde, which is one of the HAPs, and he um, found that even though there were you know, over 50 monitors across the U.S., many of them were only operating for less than 10% of the time. So there's the question of if they exist, where they exist, and then how long they're operational for. So yeah, it's a real uh, it's a real good question. And one of the reasons why it's easier to study the criteria pollutants is because there's a lot more data out there. Excellent, uh, so many questions. Are there opportunities, uh, are the opportunities for clean energy in 
the U.S. varies across states depending on the state's level of energy regulation. Like, yeah. right? How can, can and can you see that in the air quality? Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, energy is a really interesting area because it varies so much from state to state. States can choose whether to have renewable portfolio standards, state and and states vary in their how sunny they are, how windy they are, how much access they have to hydropower. So, there's there's physical limits, there's political uh limits. I think the good news when we're thinking about this these win-win solutions is it, it is also uh, up to the states how they uh, how they reduce their health relevant pollutants to meet EPA standards. So there's the opportunity at the state level to implement energy policies and to link them to uh, air quality. So both the, a lot of energy and air quality decisions are happening at the state level, which I think uh, in many ways is exciting. They always say, you know, the states are the laboratory for democracy. And I think when it comes to energy policy and climate solutions and air quality uh, planning, states I'd say are also the laboratory for innovation on those as well. Oh, uh, wow, you're just hammering these. Um, so we've got these satellite um, tools. They are obviously, we're leveraging them really powerfully for air quality assessment. Uh, but how much uncertainty is there, especially in measuring air pollution levels and what's the outlook for reducing that uncertainty either technologically through the sensors or methodologically right through correction yeah so um absolutely there are there's a lot of uncertainty with the satellite data no question about it um that uncertainty comes from a few different sources first of all uh the satellites don't see what's happening at the surface they see the column of air stretching from the surface up to space and most of uh, everybody who studies public health isn't is interested in what people are breathing and that's happening at the surface. So one layer of the issue comes with how do you link a column to what's happening at the surface? Another part of the problem is that different uh, some chemicals we can't see at all with satellites, including, for example, many of the hazardous air pollutants mentioned earlier um, and other chemicals that we see. Uh, there may be more or less noise in the signal. So, uh, for example, I was showing you those maps of formaldehyde during my talk, and formaldehyde is something you have to average over a longer time period to get a good signal to noise ratio. So it's not appropriate to look at just one day versus a different day. Nitrogen dioxide, one of the reasons it's become somewhat of a darling when it comes to linking with health and air quality is because it is one of the stronger signals and it's coming from the surface, so we address multiple of those issues. Um, there are new generations of satellites already being launched that have higher resolution, and there's a suite of three satellites around the world, one that was launched over Asia already, one that's planned to be launched over the U.S. and one over Europe, that will actually monitor these air pollutants on an hourly basis at a higher resolution than ever before. So we're really on the horizon of better satellite data for air quality and public health. And my perspective uh, working with organizations who are thinking about using this data is I've got a couple things. First of all, it is not perfect, but you know, if we don't use what we have now, it's hard to justify the growth and improvement of these tools. And it will be hard to get up to speed to use this next generation satellite data when it comes online. And I think the other issue is trying to connect the question with the science. The way we've traditionally looked at air pollution data has been through the lens of ground based monitors. And so we're so we're, we're spoiled, if you will, because we have this great data exactly where we want it every hour or even on the minute. And we know just how to use it. And so I think that there's this different question like that. You know, expecting satellite data to swap in and be used in the same way, that's just not realistic. Um, but if you um, think about other questions, and I think a good one is to say over a wide area, how are emissions changing over time? How is air pollution in the atmosphere changing over time? And that's how it was used, for example, in looking at the those COVID maps where you can see the response of the lockdown. And that's something that would have been very difficult to see clearly with 
measurement data at the ground, but the satellite does a super job. So I think a lot of it is even kind of thinking through the right question to use these data and being cognizant, cognizant of the fact that you can't just swap it in for the data that you are already using. That's great. Um, okay, I got, I got the, this one always comes up and it's a good one. Uh, so our researchers here in Kentucky have discovered that indoor air quality is generally much worse than outdoor air quality. And that's certainly true in some of the contexts I work uh, in rural India. Do you know if that's the case nationally? What else do you have to say on that question? Because you can't see that one from space. No, absolutely. Um, indoor air quality is such an interesting uh, problem because uh, it's also something that's more under our own control, where uh, we can't control that much personally about what we're breathing when we walk out the door. We can have a big impact on what is inside our own living space. And there are two big factors that affect indoor air quality. One is what is being released into the indoor environment. And the other is how much ventilation is moving it out of the indoor environment. And these ideas may sound familiar from the news um, over the past six months because um, these same ventilation issues that deal with COVID. And in fact, a lot of the experts on the airborne transmission of COVID um, are coming from an air quality background. And my colleague, Jamie Shower, who leads the State Lab of Hygiene, for example, is an air pollution person and the State Lab of Hygiene is uh, leading the state's COVID efforts. I think that there's a lot of links between indoor air quality in general and some of these newer issues, but basically dilution, getting it out of the environment typically leads to cleaner indoor air. So some chemicals are always higher indoors. Um, for example, um, certain um, volatile organic compounds that come from shampoos and perfumes, there's always going to be higher indoors than outdoors. Um, other pollutants are always higher outdoor, like ozone. And then there's some pollutants that are sort of only indoor pollu pollutants. Um, and a good example is um, humidity. Out in the outdoor environment, humidity levels are not associated with public health risks, except I mean, there's some strain on the body through climate, but they're not, you're not, it's not considered unhealthy to breathe in water. Um, but in an indoor environment, humidity actually is strongly linked to um, uh, indoor air quality, both in terms of its ability to promote mold and also um, uh, if you're allergic to dust like I am, uh, dust mites uh, go crazy at indoor humidity levels above 50%. So um, there's a lot of links between indoor and outdoor air, a lot of solutions that we can put in place. One of the nuances of thinking about better ventilation uh, for indoor environments is that that is a, a tried and true way to keep the indoor air quality cleaner. But when you have more ventilation, you're also using more energy to heat and cool a space. So trying to figure out joint solutions to um, have energy efficient homes that are also healthy and keep things ventilated is a challenge that you know a lot of companies that work in HVACs, this is their bread and butter. So it's certainly on the radar of every company working in this area. But just as we're thinking about solutions, um, there can be these trade-offs between ventilation and energy efficiency versus indoor air quality and um, uh, dispersion. I got another trade-off question, and it um, this is coming from a specific question from Northern Illinois, uh, where two large nuclear power plants are going to be closed in 2021. We closed one of two nuclear facilities here in Wisconsin only in the past decade. Um, there's a specific question: What would the air the air quality impacts be if you offset that load right with natural gas? Yeah. Um, but there's a more general question, which is: How do air quality researchers think a little bit about these different sourcing issues, especially nuclear and its many advantages? Uh, versus uh, other uh, sources. So I'm not going to ask you to crunch the numbers yeah. on, on that question, but but you might want to say something about the Illinois case or, or more generally. I'll just maybe I'll say uh, generally um, most air quality researchers don't spend a lot of time thinking about specific energy solutions. In the same way, most energy analysts don't spend a lot of time thinking about air quality. And um, this leads to this sort of weird um, outcome where everybody knows that energy makes air pollution. This is not new. 
And yet the experts on energy planning and uh, thinking about swapping fuels or energy system change, those folks usually aren't thinking that much about how this ties into air quality, public health, um, and things that we're already spending billions of dollars a year to control. And from an air quality perspective, uh, the solutions that we've been using for decades, such as uh, cleaner burning engines, cleaner fuels, scrubbers on power plants, requiring folks to get their cars emissions tested, those are so effective that air quality planners usually don't spend a lot of time thinking about the potential to swap in solar or nuclear to reduce air quality. And what it leads to me is this, is this gap where you have such a potential for energy transitions to meet air quality goals, um, but those just aren't being uh, done very much. And just as an example, you know, to my, I, I taught a Nelson Institute capstone class a couple of years ago where I had students look into this gap about uh, have clean energy policies been used for public health and air quality uh, planning? And at that time, the only state that had ever done that was Texas, where they had used energy efficiency as one way of meeting their ozone standard. There were states in the Northeast that were looking at it, but had not implemented that. So I think that um, all of these are good questions, and they probably haven't been answered yet. Um, I think with the uh, emergence of the clean power plan a few years ago, um, there was a, a, a growth of tools available to start looking at the sort of double win of climate reductions and um, air quality improvements with energy changes. So actually we could run those numbers for you pretty quickly today, but um, these tools were out there, but then the clean power plan was put on hold or more or stopped. So, um, you know, I think that I think we're on the precipice of a more integrated planning system for energy, climate and air quality. But right now, there's a lot of even obvious questions that haven't been answered yet. So if I'm an economist, this is coming off a question from Michael. So if I'm an economist, you know, I've already got the answer. We simply monetize the entire thing and we'll we'll be able to capture all this, um, which I think is pathological, but somebody can, <laughs> somebody can at me on that but it is it's a question what's the challenge that emerges from expressing dollar costs of air pollution lost work days human life expectancy michael's asking and computing those costs to the cost of implementing pollution reduction technologies in other words what are the challenges of a comprehensive picture using sort of a monetized uh, metric yeah it's an interesting question i think one one issue is that um the when you do that, there's one outcome that just dominates, and that is premature mortality. So if you start calculating the economic impacts, which you know we do, it's it's one of the ways we talk about this, but that your lost work days, your kids having asthma, those are just blips relative to the economic cost of premature mortality. So I think talking about it in dollar terms, it starts to boil it down in kind of a one dimensional way. And similarly, it's not just mortality, but it tends to be the premature mortality due to fine particulate matter. So it boils it down to one health outcome and one pollutant as dominating your story when really decision making is probably more multifaceted. Um, I'd say the other issue, and, and this is an interesting um, nuance of the Clean Air Act, is that every five years, the EPA has to reevaluate what are the health based standards um, for these six criteria pollutants. And they are not allowed to take cost into uh, account. They only can look at health data. Now, what's funny is that uh, the EPA does cost benefit assessments, and these are sometimes called regulatory impact assessments that look at all the cost. But if I was just this morning actually reading one of these regulatory impact assessments and it said this should not be used to determine. So they have this information out there. They say it's not supposed to be used. Of course, humans use the information that they're exposed to. So, you know, I think that actually the monetization and you're looking at the market to solve the problem um, is uh, fits in some ways with air quality and energy planning, but not in other ways. That's fascinating. All right. 
Um, there's an environmental justice question. To what degree has air quality analysis been done to look at differential impacts by race and income and age? Where's that analysis? Where's that discussion in the trade? Yeah, that is a very big uh, part of the analysis that's happening with air quality. And I would say it's a growing uh, part of the analysis. Um, my, uh, I showed you some plots uh, from the work that we were doing funded by the Joyce Foundation. Actually, my Nelson Institute master student, Karen Gallagher, she took the output from this EPA model and compared it with census data on race and income across Wisconsin and other Midwest states to look at what areas were being disproportionately affected. And, and her results, like many studies before, found that lower income communities are often um, exposed to higher levels of air pollution. And if we think about why this is, um, there's it's very well known that highways and major roadways have um, higher levels of pollution, that um, industries and power plants are often not located in the wealthiest uh, white communities. And so these uh, the sources of air pollution uh, are being placed uh, geographically in areas that also correspond to um, a lot of economic and racial patterns. So environmental justice is a huge part of this field. Um, in my own work, uh, I've looked started looking at global air pollution, looking at US air pollution, and you need specialized tools to have enough uh, resolution in your data to be able to zoom in and actually see community scale impacts. And actually, this is a big part of uh, when we're thinking about satellite data, because the satellite data are just not high resolution enough on their own to be useful for environmental justice questions, for example. Um, but researchers are saying, well, maybe we can fuse kind of combo platter the satellite data with low cost monitors or advanced models to try to parse the data in a way that can be used to address these, these important questions. Uh, I'm just going to follow up fr freewheeling here. Uh, is, is the problem comparable to the downscaling question with climate data that's aggregated these big cells? Can it be yes, something it, with applied math? You're an applied mathematician. I, I was, yes, yeah. I, but yeah, it is in, in many ways. I think one thing is that, you know, with climate data, especially when we're thinking about future climate, it's coming from a model. So if your model gets to be higher resolution, your climate data will be. Um, that's true for me when with I use a lot of models, so it's exactly the same problem. Um, but when it comes to air quality, there's three main data sources. There's the models, which are wonderful, but you know, there's also the on the ground measurements. And if a community doesn't have a monitor, then we don't know what is actually happening in that community. And these monitors are very expensive. The ones that are used for EPA regulatory grade data, you know, I've heard the sort of the number thrown around that it costs about $100,000 to site a new monitor and about $20,000 a year to maintain it. Of course, that depends what kind and where it is. But just to give you an idea that, that starting to think about 10 or 100 or 1,000 more monitors, we're really talking about big dollars. And that's why there's a lot of excitement now around low cost monitors, a couple hundred dollars. Uh, and like one company that's really growing in this area is called Purple Air. And with Purple Air, anyone can order a monitor, put it in their backyard, and upload the data to the Purple Air network. And I think that one of the challenges here is um, these are not as high quality and rigorous and reliable as the $100,000 EPA monitor, uh, but it does offer you the opportunity to get a lot more coverage and to be targeting communities and locations um, where there's the concern from a justice perspective. Super cool, I'm imagining like whole projects, EJ projects around this. Um, so there's an interesting question here about using satellite technology to measure, verify and enforce greenhouse gas emission agreements in the Paris style, yeah. if it ever grew teeth, could we do it? I mean, because verification is always something that people kvetch about. Yeah, maybe. Um, one of the issues when it comes to um, atmosphere, anything in the atmosphere, is how long does it stay in the atmosphere? And this is an issue because carbon dioxide, for example, stays in the atmosphere for over 100 years. So when you see the satellites are seeing what's actually there, 
And when it's staying in the atmosphere for such a long time, it starts to become a big blob that builds up and it's harder to see how it relates back to individual power plants or individual cities. Um, so satellites can see CO2, but it's a problem to try to trace it back to where it came from. And satellites can see methane, but it's a little trickier to find where it came from. And that's what brings us back to like nitrogen dioxide, like I was showing you in the earlier images. Nitrogen dioxide is not a climate gas. It is not a greenhouse gas, but it's emitted from the same sources that emit carbon dioxide and uh, fossil fuel. Any, anything that burns emits both carbon dioxide and nitrogen dioxide. So there's been a number of researchers who have been trying to say, can we estimate carbon dioxide emissions from the nitrogen dioxide satellite data as a way to um, pave the way for potential you know, enforcement or better quantification. We can't solve problems unless we know what they are. Okay, we got, we've been down in the techie weeds. I, I got Becky Ryan here. She's our undergraduate advisor, the lead advisor uh, for environmental studies. And she wants to know, first she says she values our, that our program focuses on instilling students with interdisciplinary problem solving skills. And she's right. In your opinion, Dr. Holloway, what are the top three issues on the horizon that environmental studies undergraduate students should be tuned into? Top three issues. And I'm sure the easy answers are like climate change, biodiversity decline. Like I got an easy. Give us the like maybe something a little subtle, fine grain surprise us. Well, you know, I, I guess um, my easy answers might be different than your easy answers, Paul. But also, you know, I guess I like to start with the low hanging fruit. And I think one issue is energy. Because a lot of students don't think of energy as an environmental issue. I think many maybe because energy and engineering sort of go together. They sort of think of power plants and technology as, as not Nelson Institute topics. But when it comes to the air and climate solutions, the solution is cleaner energy. And so I would really love to see a lot of our students um, engaging in energy with a solutions oriented perspective and an environmental motivation. I think that would be a big one. Um, another one I would say is big data. And uh, there's uh, so much information across environmental issues coming from satellites, from these low cost sensors, from citizen science. And students having some basic skills about how to map it, how to look at it, how to do an Excel spreadsheet. Um, those skills are uh, utilizing the next generation of science for um, the environment. And they also build skills that are super employable. And uh, I guess that's maybe my last one, just maybe to wave my own flag, but I'll say air quality, because in the same way that um, that a lot of students don't think about energy as much, air quality uh, over the years has typically been an upper level course in chemistry or an upper level course in engineering. And I'm uh, over the about a past 10 years, I've been developing a course through the Nelson Institute and the Department of Atmospheric and Oceanic Sciences it's an introduction to air quality that students can take with no prerequisites. So in my class this semester, we have an English major, we have a grad student in engineering and everything in between. And it's really exciting because air quality relates to planning, to health, to decision making, um, to engineering, and um, to see students from across campus coming, learning these skills, and then hopefully going and taking them, whether in their role as a citizen or as a professional environmental uh, problem solver. Uh, I think that those are sort of three things that I would love to see undergraduates embrace. Awesome answer. Becky, you got all that? Uh, <laughs> and I'm going to close with one last question. There's a lot more out there, um, but it's a bit about globalizing this. So we've talked about North America, we've talked about the Clean Air Act, the particular regulatory and satellite availability, data availability. What happens if I want to do this in Latin America or Sri Lanka? or somewhere else. Where are we on data? How global is it? America? Yeah. Um, so uh, first I'll say that the US was has the earliest major air pollution rules and the, from the World Health Organization to other countries, many countries are sort of are, have modeled their approach to air pollution regulation after the US. So it's not just parochial and provincial to start looking at the US, but it, it does have relevance at the global scale. Um, satellite data, 
the current generation of satellite data are available for the whole globe in many cases every day. So everything that we've done for the US with satellite data can be done other places. And I've worked with students looking at air pollution in India from satellite data or China, where you don't have as many monitors or they may not be publicly available or both. And so um, I think satellite data is really exciting in a global health context because it provides an apples to apples comparison of air quality around the world. And in, for many countries, it may be the best source of data available. So doing an analysis where we're looking at models, measurements, and satellite data in North America, where we have all three sources of data, I think can um, showcase where and when satellite data is a good indicator of what people are breathing around the world. Right on. That brings us to a close. There's a bunch of other questions and we just don't have time for them. You're, you're just too much in demand, Dr. Holloway. So wherever you are out there, if you do have further questions, you can always bombard Tracy's inbox. Uh, she is a public scholar and available to uh, all of the Nelson community. Do not hesitate to reach out to her. Is that fair? That, absolutely. I love getting email and it was just so much fun to be part of this event today. Uh, and uh, hopefully I'll meet you all uh, next year at the Terrace for the rendezvous. Oh, I really hope so. <laughs> all right. Thank you, Tracy. If you're out there, people, just go ahead and get virtual applause. We thank you for coming. Uh, last pitch this afternoon on our LinkedIn page at, I believe, five o'clock local time. That's central time. We're going to be opening up chat room, a kind of a com conversation, discussion, meet and greet. And there's going to be a lot of alumni there, a lot of faculty. Um, so don't miss out. It's essentially a virtual cocktail hour in the absence of the terrace. My thank you to Dr. Tracy Holloway, the Gaylord Nelson Professor of Integrated Environmental Studies at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Y'all have a happy 50th anniversary of the Nelson Institute. Thank you.